All right, recording. Uh, this is the first screen recording of my programming Rehearsal Pro to be rewritten using Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. Uh, actually, I've been working on this project for a while, since the beginning of the project, We're kind of in the middle of it. And I'm going to cover today a significant change, which is right now we have two, we have uh, the existing iOS app, uh, which we're seeing here in Xcode. And I'll explain all this in a minute. Uh, basically, this is Xcode. This project, Rehearsal Pro, has been in existence for many, many, many years, and it's gone through uh, many generations and different programmers. I'm now the current programmer maintaining it and also working on the Android, uh, the port to Android. And I've been using Kotlin multi-platform because it the application is already quite successful. It's, it's fully functional. It's working in iOS. I'm going to create an Android version. And, we're gonna, and I've been doing this incrementally by basically injecting the Kotlin into key spots and rewriting those spots uh, while I build up the new Android version, which is over here, using Android Studio. And meanwhile, fixing bugs, actually adding new features to iOS, primarily when I'm focused on the having the Android version working is quite a ways off. Uh, right now, we're just getting out the next release for iOS which includes a lot of fixes and, and a new feature, a couple of new features, some layout changes. Uh, but basically the idea is that I've kept the original iOS Xcode project intact. I've made it a sub-module within a new repo. It's a sub-module of the Kotlin multi-platform project, which I guess I should probably show. Let's get rid of this, we don't need that. Uh, somewhere here I have a finder. And let's get the right window. You can't really see what I'm doing because I'm on the second screen. Here we go. I think we want this guy. This is kind of the way I do my development. Uh, for this project, I'm on Mac because in order to <laughs> deploy anything for iOS, you pretty much have to have a Mac. I mean, there, there are some ways to do it using uh, virtual machines and all that, but I'm not interested in going down that road. I tend to use my Mac for web development and stuff like that. Uh, although I've been off Linux for a while, I'm going to be transitioning back to that for everything else that's not Mac related. Uh, I still have Windows, of course, because I do a lot of Unreal Engine. Uh, hopefully I can get that running on Linux as well or running Windows in a VM, but I'm really tired of using Windows. I could just keep my Windows desktop mostly for games or for game development that I do. But when it comes to mobile, uh, I've always done mobile on Mac. Uh, I have used Android Studio on Windows. It's really flaky, and it's really unnecessary since pretty much I do simultaneously Android and iOS. It makes sense to have a Mac. It's very portable. Anyway, all that. This is an M1, 16-inch, uh, 2021. I'm running, still running an older version of Mac OS. I am very loath to upgrade right away. Uh, so I'm on Monterey which means I can't actually uh, build for the latest iOS 17 yet until I upgrade to Ventura. So I'm going to be doing that shortly. For now, we're stuck with uh, our versions going all the way to iOS uh, 16. I'm talking a lot, not really showing much. Uh, this app, a rehearsal runs, uh, we still support iOS 11. And if we were to upgrade from that or, or move the minimum up, we would lose 5% of our existing users. So I decided not to do that. For that reason, a Swift UI can't be used because iOS 13 requires Swift UI. But not rewriting the UI anyway, so that's kind of a moot point. Turn on the music a little bit. Just listen to some background music. Hopefully that kind of nice atmosphere there. A little dark though, isn't it? It's dark. This is dark work. Okay. So back to where we are. So this is a Kotlin multi-platform. I'm not doing a tutorial, an intro. You know, if you don't know multi-platform, you can go learn it somewhere else. I'm kind of deep in the in the trenches here. Um, it's got the standard structure. Notice that I have renamed uh, the standard directories. They typically have this as Android app, this as iOS app, and this as shared. But I find using sticking with the really generic folder names makes it really hard to tell where you are when you're working on multiple projects, right? So if you have a subfolder Android app or iOS app or shared, you've got multiple projects open and you've got editor windows and stuff like that. All you see is this name. You don't know what you're on. 
Also, this sorts them nicely together and it makes it clear. So I like short directory names. I like short names in general, but I also like specific names. And I have no problem uh, condensing down to acronyms. Technically, this is an acronym, not an initialism. A lot of people confuse the two of those. I mean, I did for the longest time. Um, so we've got rehearsal Android, rehearsal iOS, rehearsal shared. Uh, once you understand that, it's very clear where you are and what's going on. This is the shared directory, uh, typical for iOS. I have kept the uh, standard folders, even though I, don't, again, don't like this arrangement. I would like to see common at the top and then Android and iOS are maybe platform independent. It's what they're calling common platform independent and then Android and iOS as platforms for, for a long time. That's how I've done it in my multi-platform development. But we're sticking with the standards for now. We've got iOS test, common man, all that good stuff. Um, trying to do as much code as we can inside the common main. So we can look at it either in the IDE over here, Android Studio, uh, and I'm using, uh, is it the latest and greatest? I don't know, it's Flamingo or something. What are we running here? Giraffe, okay, so it's, it's a fairly recent version. It might be the open standard one. Uh, I, again, I'm loath to upgrade because upgrading tends to break things. Uh, okay, so what do we got? Uh, this is our common stuff. So this is an FPMob project. What is FPMob? FPMob. FPMob is functional programming for mobile. It's a project kind of envelope that I've started. This is really the main project. I plan on having a lot of sample projects that uh, demonstrate this. But the idea is you can do functional programming in mobile. There are other efforts that are, that are well underway have done this. Lambda Native is probably the most prominent one. It's built on top of Gambit Scheme, a scheme being a Lisp, um, but it doesn't use native APIs. It tends to render straight using OpenGL. So it's kind of a flutterish sort of approach to mobile. It is multi-platform, it's been around for a long time. It was built for some medical uh, use cases and it obviously specifically sponsored by that work. Uh, this is an approach that basically says, look, we're going to use native APIs. Native APIs in Android are object-oriented, obviously. They're Java, they're Kotlin, there are lots of classes, massive class hierarchy, a lot of subclassing, a lot of inheritance, a lot of shared mutable state. Um, nothing we can do about that. That's the framework. Same thing on iOS. You've got UIKit, you've got Swift UI. Although, you know, the future is, uh, sorry, Swift UI and Jetpack Compose being supposedly functional in the sense, I mean, that's where they get the name compose, the composing of functions. But if you look at it, there's still a lot of inheritance. There's a lot of classes. There's a lot of shared mutable state, not in the UI layer itself, obviously. Uh, they've got the idea of uh, passing by values and re-rendering and rebuilding the render state, essentially. Uh, again, I'm not doing a tutorial. I'm not trying to explain any of that. You can find that elsewhere. I am using Jetpack Compose over here, not the multi-platform Compose. Last time I tried it, it was pretty broken. Um, and uh, we're not going that route. Again, we're not rewriting the UI, we're not really rewriting much on iOS at this point. Um, so that's not all that useful. Although I have added new UI code over here and I've done it in a functional style. So what does it mean to be functional? What it means over here is that the common code, most of the, the new code that I've written here, uh, this is how I organize my functional code. I think the most important distinction is what's pure and what's not. And so you can see my top level directories essentially are pure inside. Basically what it says is these are all functions and data structures. So this is FP. These are not, I mean, even though we're using the data class in Kotlin, uh, on the Swift side, these are structs. Uh, and this is effectively a struct. Right, uh, you know, we do, I guess we have these are, these aren't really methods, right? These are copy operations. These are really just conveniences. They just are shortcuts for this sort of thing. So uh, we've got structures, we've got values, which <laughs> literally functions. Uh, this is something new we'll talk about in a minute. But basically uh, the main logic is here in app flow. And this is under side, because these are side effects. These are side affecting functions, but it's all freestanding functions, top level functions. So one of the nice things about Kotlin is if you want to go functional, you can go pretty functional. You can make data structures using the data class. You could use 
a regular class, but data class looks more like a data structure, and it keeps it keeps you from getting crazy with you know OO methods and shared mutable state and all the things we're trying to avoid. Um, so anyway, yeah, this stuff is all, as you can see, data structures, data structures, data structures, more data structures, and freestanding functions, right? These are pure functions. This is a pure function. It's a transformation. It's a calculation, right? Uh, our goal always in functional programming is to get as much stuff out of here in the side effect category and up into the pure category. So it's kind of nice that it sorts that way. We see pure, we see side, and that's our goal. Uh, we do the same thing under the uh, platform specific stuff. So there's actually one little pure guy there. What is that? This is, again, a function. And this is an example of taking something that's in the framework, that's OO, and still just saying, look, just give me the app state from this intent. This creates an app state object, object, data structure, data class, data, data object, whatever you want to call it, and uh, constructs, a, constructs an initial one based on an existing intent. So it's, for all practical purposes, it's pure. Of course, we're not really sure what these methods do exactly if they depend on something environmental, but we're assuming they don't. It's kind of hard to tell what's pure and what's not pure when you touch anything inside an OO framework. That's just the way it goes. Most of the stuff is side effecting, so it's down here. And that's how we have that organized. Under the iOS main, what do we got? We got nothing. And this is new, and I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, well, let's talk about that now. So what's the big deal about this particular session? Uh, we have added, we, <laughs> the royal we, it's been just me. We've added SQL, we, I keep saying we, it's, it, sorry, it comes from teaching windsurfing where um, we try not to say I, you know, me and you, we always try to say we. Um, I have added SQL Delight. I've injected SQL Delight in here to replace, to basically be the persistence that's multi-platform, right? That's the main multi-platform database persistence um, framework, library, thing uh, that Kotlin Multiplatform uses. It's been around. It seems to work pretty well. This is my first time using it. And what I am doing here, let me say specifically the task at hand. Right now the app um, has a feature for scripts called line sets. And when scripts are shared, these line sets are getting duplicated when someone does a rename on them. So it's a synchronization with the back end, persistence issue, but it's really hard to tell where the problem is. And one of the reasons it's hard to tell is, well, mainly it's old code that I didn't write, so I'm not familiar with it. I don't fully understand how it all works. So this is gonna be a learning process. But um, another aspect of it is the legacy code. So this is the iOS project. This has been reorganized. This used to have lots of source libraries and stuff. There have been a lot of different developers working on this, and it's gone through a generation. Still, half the code, probably more than half the code, is in Objective-C, and some of the code is in Swift. Um, my plan is, of course, to rewrite it all as much as possible in Kotlin, so we're introducing the third rewrite or the third language. But any of the iOS code is going to be in Swift, and there's quite a bit of stuff that's going to stay on the iOS side uh, for now. So I reorganized all the original source directories, one so I could just kind of learn them and also be able to follow what's going on better. We've got dead code. This is actually just going through the project. I was able to find code that just isn't needed. It's there, it's in the project, never gets called, never gets used, pull it out. This dead folder has a setting inside the Xcode uh, build settings that ignores, the compiler ignores it, does not build anything in here. And uh, the plan is to move a lot of code in there. I'm keeping it around. Obviously, this could be deleted in the repo, but uh, it's not hurting anything leaving it there, and it gives us some historical perspective. This is the legacy code of the app itself. I've reorganized it in a very different way than what it was originally. Originally, these were all a lot of top-level folders based on categories and topics, and it wasn't very consistent. Again, not to blame any of the developers, it's gone through several 
programmers have gone through this over the years, handed off from one to the next. Uh, and I'm the current shepherd of it. So, um, gee, I sure hope the recording is going okay. I didn't even, even check out any of that. Well, we're just gonna assume it's fine. I'm talking to myself anyway. Not doing this live, not yet. That's coming up. All right. Um, what I did is I split it into mainly Objective-C and Swift. You can see there are other directories here for stuff that's neither, right? So this is a plist file. Uh, obviously, it's metadata for Google service. Uh, these are just straight up uh, the main storyboard and some kind of freestanding zibs. There are more zibs in here uh, alongside the source files that, that they go with. So Objective-C and Swift. And what I did is I reorganized it. I reorganized it based on dependencies, and I find that very helpful in development. When you're looking at code, one of the key things is what does it depend on? In an OO framework, really what you're saying is, what is its subclass, if there's inheritance, and there's a lot of inheritance in here. But also, not necessarily subclass, but what's the kind of highest level dependency that it that, that in that code depends on? And you really can see that inside the import statements and the includes and things like this. Like here we can see all the things this includes. And maybe this isn't even right. No, okay, UI kit, watch kit, yeah. Anyway, um, but you can see how there's a lot of the same stuff. So you can see the original code was Objective-C. A lot of newer code is in, right? There's more Objective-C code than there is Swift code. And there's been some renames and stuff like that. Uh, this uses Alamo Fire framework for networking. These are classes only dependent on Alamo Fire. Uh, this is stuff only on the foundation itself. This is stuff on uh, the NS, the NS, uh, NS object, next step object. Uh, but the most relevant ones, obviously, are the UI ones here. Are they mo the most relevant? Well, probably. Um, and uh, this is all the highest level stuff that depends on the app level of the UI. So. If this isn't dealing with the UI directly, like rehearsal, like app delegate here, you can see we got app, app delegate, which depends on UI application delegate. And these other things also somehow depend on or refer to or touch that. The easiest to follow stuff here would be everything subclassing a UI view is in here. You can see there's some zibs. So there we got a movable cell, NS object. Uh, is this subclass a UI view? Well, not necessarily, but well, yeah, UI gesture register. Yeah, it's view related, but it's not the view controller. These guys are all view controllers. It's controller, 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 right? View controller, view controller, view controller. And then we have the iOS, uh, the iOS Swift equivalents. These are all view controllers. These are all views. These are just elements, they're neither views. So this helps me. When I'm going to look for stuff, I can get a sense of, of where the hierarchy is, right? Uh, and as part of refactoring, it's gonna be trying to move these things out of the highest level dependencies into lower level dependencies where that makes sense. A lot of PDF classes in here. This shouldn't be dependent on any, any uh, UI classes. You can see it only, it only imports a foundation header. So that looks pretty good. This is a core data object, right? It'd be nice to have a dependency graph where we can see all that. But obviously this is clearly dependent on the PDF libraries and the PDF functionality. You can see that here, PDF. Uh, pretty sure it's using iOS PDF library stuff in here. Anyway, but today we're dealing with core data. So uh, iOS, the default, if you're gonna persist, is going to be creating core data classes. This is an ORM, a fond, fond, fond ORM, object relational mapper. It sits on top of SQLite, which is a database that's pretty much everywhere and built into mobile devices. And Core Data sits on top of that and tries to provide an uh, originally an Objective-C abstraction, now a Swift abstraction. In fact, there's a new thing coming out, I think, Swift Data 
where it's still kind of the old core data API, uh, but now part of the Swift UI rewrite, compatible with Swift UI. I don't know much about it. I'm not gonna use it. It's not multi-platform. But the SQLite sitting underneath it is multi-platform. So it makes sense to use SQL Delight under KMP because they have a driver for Android and they have a driver for iOS. And so in theory, writing the same Kotlin code and the same SQL code defined over here at the higher level at the KMP. By the way, in case you're wondering, here's the KMP project. It's the, the top level of the KMP project, which is um, REH KMP. I showed you the shared folder. This is the actual iOS project that we were just looking at. This is the original iOS project. It simply made a submodule in here. Right. Uh, get submodule status. So REH iOS is a submodule, and that is the original repo. This actually has all the original history of the original source file. It was simply moved in there, and then piecemeal, I've been injecting the Kotlin multi-platform stuff into it. So we can actually see it as a subfolder under here. But I keep the Xcode on this desktop over here, and I keep my folder over here in the subfolder, and I kind of do my Xcode from here, and my KMP column side from here. And I offset the windows kind of, this is on the left, this is on the right. Oop, that's a different desktop. <clears throat> so I know what I'm looking at. With different colored shells, All right. iOS, KMP, iOS, KMP. That's the way I work. <clears throat> so back to what we're looking at. So there's a problem with line sets. We go into core data. <clears throat> Actually, what I did already is I took all the line set code from core data. Here's all the Objective-C code that's specific to line sets. And I moved into the dead folder. I yanked it out, which of course completely broke the build as I intended for it to break the build, okay? And in doing that, it allows me to uncover everything touching a line set. So it used to be in this directory, it was moved out. We have line scenes, we have scenes. So what am I gonna do? I'm not replacing all of the persistent classes. I am literally putting SQL Delight in play and I'm gonna store just line sets now in the new SQL Delight tables. Keep everything else still in core data for the iOS side. This is a proof of concept. I'm trying to make sure I can use SQL Delight that it's gonna work. Ultimately, it will replace all of the core data. That is a very long, big task. So, we're just gonna put our toes into the pool at this point. It's a little tricky because obviously most of this stuff is still gonna be the original core data. And when it goes out to try to auto-magically connect to and relate the line sets to the other objects it's connected to, it's going to find that it's gonna to have to do something different. In this case, delegate to Kotlin code. And that's exactly where we're at. So in order to get this to build, the first thing I did was I moved all these files over. So let's take a look at a couple of these commits, actually. So here we are. The last four commits are part of this development branch. And the very first thing I did here was I moved the legacy line set source file to the dead folder. So let's take a look at that. Let me do a git show head three. And this really was just a drag. It's a drag, that's all it did. By the way, I use commit git from the command line. This is my philosophy of development. I don't like to be insulated from how git works. I think git is as important as programming language, even more so in the fact that it is one of the few things that have actually been standardized across software development. Uh, Nobody uses all the same language. Nobody uses all the same platform. Nobody uses all the same tool. But nowadays, almost every developer uses Git. So it's as close as a universal standard as we have for anything. Good or bad, there's a lot of good in that. And I'm a fan of Git. I think it's a good thing. I've been around quite a while. 
I go all the way back to the days of CVS, Subversion, Microsoft Source Safe, uh, the Rational thing, what was that called? Clear Case. Uh, the first time I moved to a distributed version control, I used Mercurial, which was written in Python, and enjoyed that quite a bit, and then moved on to Git. And that's where we are, GitHub, GitLab, Git, 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 Git. Yay. But using uh, things that insulate you from the commands, for me, causes my Git skills to atrophy. Now, I'm not an expert by any means in all that Git does. But for day-to-day -day Gitness, I can pretty much do it all from the command line. I like to see how it works. OK, uh, diatribe over. So there's our shell. We moved the files. And what this did, of course, is it broke the build. Now, my basic philosophy in git commits, I do like small commits. Let's do a, let's do a name status, uh, git log, name status, so we can see the files that were actually changed. OK. So here we got renames. 100% renames, meaning nothing changed inside. Uh, this was automatically updated by the Xcode project. This broke the build. My basic philosophy is I make small commits, but I try to make sure that each commit is buildable so that you could bisect at any point or you could just pick off various commits and you know be able to diagnose and figure out where, where your problems are. Uh, but in the case of moves and renames, I find it really difficult to forensically analyze commit history where the renames are combined with, with significant code changes. So I tend to do the renames and the moves as a separate thing because that way when you do a diff, let's do a diff, right, of this particular commit, all I see is, oh, actually there are some, there are some comments in there, which, I'm, which I will, no. That shouldn't be right. It said 100, that's something weird here. That's the commenting out part. Oh, uh, my mistake. I'm, I'm diffing, I'm obviously diffing between where I am currently and that particular commit. The show is exactly what we wanted to see. What it showed is there's really only deltas, there's really only changes to the project file, the Xcode project file that's indecipherable. And these are just renames. So that way, when we actually make code changes, we'll see the code changes. And that's what we're actually going to see. Anyway. All right, and then that was what we're seeing in the uh, second commit. In the second commit, I had to actually add comments to the dead code because there is an include file that goes through and pulls a bunch of headers and it actually pulls the it actually pulls the headers in from the dead file, the dead folder. So Xcode is ignoring, it's not compiling any of these M files or these Swift files. But I believe, but I haven't confirmed it. This bridging header, which is a thing that tends to show up in uh, iOS projects that have Objective C and Swift mixed together. This is a way for basically the, the two languages to kind of see each other. You can see it's pulling in a lot of stuff and it's just naming headers without paths in quotes. And Xcode will go and suck some of these things in. And since we don't want any of this to be included, we're leaving it in there. We're not deleting the H files, but uh, we're commenting out. And that's what this is here. And notice that because I did the move as a separate commit, as a second commit, I can see the very specific change, right? The, the move has already happened. So now it's much easier to read this. If we see the moves in this together, uh, it can confuse Git. It can think that it's just a new file and all that. All right. But that wasn't the key thing. The key thing is this previous commit in which I'm commenting out and replacing all references to, to the remaining code that's part of the project, to the non-dead code. I guess you could call it live code. Um, 
and I'm aliasing it to this new Kotlin class. That's what it looks like in Objective-C, and this is what it looks like to Swift. And I'm just disabling. I'm commenting out a lot of stuff. My goal here is to just get it to build, right? We did it. We pulled a bunch of files out, commented out a bunch of header includes. Build's going to be broken all over the place. This gets us back to a solid build. So we basically have two commits where the build's broken, which I don't like, but it's an exception to the rule for uh, the ability to diagnose. And this is where our build is back here. And I actually uh, get logged this uh, to an out file, easier to read. And these are all the comments, and you can see the rewrite, 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 rewrite. Why does this matter? Because now what I'm doing is I'm going to go in, I've already gone in, and I put a breakpoint on every one of these re every one of these commented out sections of code that are still in the app. And there's a lot of them. Let's take a look. <laughs> so these are breakpoints on all the code that needs to be rewritten. What fun is that? Look at that. And you can see it's all over the place. This line set uh, domain object effectively gets touched by a lot of things. A lot of UI code, a lot of other domain code, and this stuff has to get replaced. And we can see that here. Here's where a whole section was commented out just to get it to build. So I literally need to go through every one of these and rewrite these to use the new SQL Delight. Yeah, it's non-trivial. But for now, I'm going to put breakpoints and I'm going to run the app just to see where these things get called. So there's going to be a lot of refactoring. Well, you really can't call it refactoring. From the user's point of view, nothing should change. So technically, it is a refactor, but it's a rewrite. It's a pretty big rewrite. Um, so let's go back and take a look at what we came up with for SQL Delight. So on the Kotlin side, where are we? Sometimes my brain wants to clear, I just do a git status and try to see where I am. Okay, I've got a couple of bin scripts that I haven't pushed. They're not relevant right now. So that looks fine. I'm on this branch, dev is SQL delight E. These are the commits that I've made so far. Quite a few, actually. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't need to go through all the details. Basically, this is where we added the dependencies for SQL delight. This is where we defined a database. This is where we added actual SQL, which uh, let's take a look at the actual SQL itself. There it is right there, not too hard to find under common main, Rehearsal Pro, SQL Delight. And this is what we got, opening it up in Vim. If we look at it in, uh, in Android Studio, it actually gives you some syntax checking going on here. It'll actually give you errors. This is used as a SQL Delight plugin. Uh, I tend to do most of my work outside the editors, even though I have I do have uh, Vim keys, Vim bindings on Android Studio here, so it's not too bad. So I mean, I can I can get around with Vim. Unfortunately, I don't have that next code. I haven't bothered to try to figure that out, but I'm going to be switching to Emacs fairly soon anyway. So I have to relearn everything from scratch. But this is all we've done. And again, I'm new to SQL Delight. Obviously, I've used SQL a lot over the years. I understand it. I know how these things work. But this is a new tool. And all we're doing is a single table. We've got a couple of procedures here. All right. Again, this is not going to be a tutorial on how to use SQL Delight. I mean, I'll be tutorialing myself. This is essentially the table that represents uh, what was line set over there. I've kept essentially the same number of columns here that match the data members over there, uh, properties in Xcode parlance. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at the old guy. So this is gonna be under core data properties. Remember this is now dead code. So here are the properties of the original line set. Um, there's also some methods that I have to deal with that I'm, these are gonna be rewritten as functions. But essentially, this is our, this should match for the most part our table with some renames. And I've gone ahead and uh, 
put in the appropriate SQL types where they make sense. Uh, things like IDs should really be primary keys that are integers, but I want this to work with the current data, and as you can see, this stuff is mostly all strings. So this is what we got to figure out. We got to map this core data ORM stuff to SQL Delight ORM stuff <laughs> that actually maps to SQL. I mean, under the covers, this core data is sitting on top of SQLite database, so it is implicitly got some kind of schema. It probably doesn't look exactly like this. Obviously, different names and stuff, but the types, who knows how it maps out its relationships. Um, but in SQL Delight, it's a little bit different. It's less of an ORM, and it's more of a SQL wrapper. Uh, as you can see, we can actually see the schema. In fact, we define the schema. In the case of core data, this thing's a black box, right? It's generating some kind of SQL schema for us. We don't know exactly what it looks like. I'm sure there's some tools and utilities we could get in there and look at the actual SQLite database. But for the most part, you're supposed to, you're supposed to black box and trust that it's gonna do the right thing. SQLite is different. It's like, well, I'll tell you what, you're in control of the SQL. Here's the SQL. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate wrappers for you. And that's what we get. Um, not a fan of generated code. Of course, I don't like a lot of hand rolled boilerplate code either. So the trade off is worst case scenario, hand rolled boilerplate code. Next would be generated boilerplate code, which we get here. Better would be higher level abstractions in which neither boilerplate nor generated code are necessary. And that's really going to show up in more dynamic languages and cleverly uh, designed frameworks that do that. But let's take a look at this. So basically, SQL Delight is pretty simple. Uh, that's interesting. Here's these imports. Oh, the imports are needed for the actual SQL file. OK, there's a reason. That's interesting. Um, where are we? Uh, generated. Okay, so uh, da, 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 da. okay, so we're in the shared module. So this is the shared module, which is called rehearsal sh rehearsal sha rusha rusha rusha. Here's our S sq file, SQL file, and our code gets generated under generated under SQL delight. Not too hard to find. This is following the package name, typical Java like subfolders represent dots in a package name, which. Is Drives me crazy. And data line set is our table. And this is what the generated code looks like. Not too bad. So I'm already starting to become a fan of this because this is pretty clean. I basically have a data class, which is what I want from an FP standpoint. Right? And you can see right there. This table declaration generated this data class. Generated, not hand rolled. Same names, we've got Kotlin types. This is what I thought was strange, these import statements. These shouldn't be necessary, right? I mean, these are, the Kotlin package is automatically visible. These types are automatically visible. This is a Kotlin file, so I don't know why that's needed. The only thing that stands out here that's a little funky is, and actually makes this a dependency on SQL Delight itself, is this column adapter. Uh, why do we have a column adapter? Ordinal sort integer as in not null default. Why did it make an adapter? I'm not sure why. It didn't do that for this. Int long, int long. Huh. It's an adapter. Not sure what that is. As it means it's stored as an int? It's stored as a long, it's converted to an int. Integer as int, not null default. I might not need this. There might be a way to do this so that it doesn't, I mean, this just seems kind of silly. Int to long, long to int. I saw sort in here and I thought it was some kind of sort function, but this is just the name of this particular column. It doesn't know that that means it's gonna be used for sorting. So it must have something to do with this type declaration. All right, I'll figure that out. I'd like to get rid of that. It would be nice for this to just be a pure data class with no dependencies. Even though it's generated by SQL Delight, it really only depends on this, this adapter class. 
I would like that not to be the case. Anyway, pretty clean, right? So you get a data class for the table declarations. Great, nice. And then um, you get queries for the procedures you've essentially written. I'm calling these procedures, but I don't know specifically what these are. Uh, you know, they could be named procedures if they were actually stored in the database, but they're not. They obviously get converted to these guys here. Uh, so, like, let's say delete, there it is, insert line set. So here's an example, insert line set. And this is a public function, and it's a member of a class, unfortunately. Uh, this class is just acting as a namespace, I would think. Is this a singleton? It's not really a singleton. Got some adapters. Yeah, you know, the driver, you've got to create it with the driver. It's got a whole bunch of typical stuff. Um, but here we can see what the boilerplate is doing, the generated boilerplate is doing for us. So this is the actual SQL injection right here. I mean, at runtime, we're passing a string. So we're doing runtime interpretation of SQL. This is not compiled, right? This is passed to SQLite. So we're using a compiled language sitting on top of an interpreting engine from the standpoint of SQL, and then we're doing binding. This is, this is my point where this should be unnecessary, right? If my execution environment ultimately is gonna be interpreted, why can't I have all of this interpreted and have higher level abstractions, macros, some kind of service that doesn't require either the generation of the code or the writing of the boilerplate. This is the middle ground, which is boilerplate generated for me. But if I was debugging it, I would obviously have to step in and see what's going on. It's pretty straightforward though. We got binding. This is just our typical impedance mismatch, right? We've got data and data types represented by one system. In this case, in this case a relational database with X SQL as the representation, the language as you were, declarative language for dealing with that, to a compiled, uh, statically typed, high-level programming language that's multi-paradigm, that's imperative in some cases, declarative in others, mostly imperative. Uh, this is imperative, right? I mean, we can see right here, this is obviously not a function. Uh, we're dependent on this external driver. It's very side, of, it's very side effectful going on here. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm not doing any actual work. I'm just talking about all this, but it's a good way for me to get my thoughts in place. So uh, it generated that, and then it generated this third thing, which is pretty much just kind of the apparatus for the driver which is kind of a platform independent abstraction. And all we seem to have needed to do is to create the, our uh, instantiate the driver for the platform. And I may have to figure out how to use this properly or it's gonna happen automatically. I'm not sure yet. So anyway, that's generated code. What's in here? Ooh. I didn't see this before. So implementation, oh, it's table creator. Private class, public schema, public object schema create. So I've got a class, well, I've got an object. So this is a singleton. Hmm. Typical OO stuff which I am massively guilty of thrusting upon the world for many years. Um, we've got a class, which is basically a namespace. I mean, there is a, there is a member sitting in here. There are two members sitting in here, so. Okay. Migrate, instantiate the table. Again, it's just making calls dynamically. Unless this gets somehow JIT compiled into something, but I don't think so. It's gonna execute, it's gonna pass a string every time. Although create table is not exactly going to be a bottleneck, right? 
But the inserts and the gets are going to definitely be in the pipeline of all the persistent operations that take place. Well, we'll come back to that at some point. And then over here, how do we get this database even started? Well, uh, I have a particular architecture that's functional. Again, this is part of FP Mob, FP Mob, FP Mob. Can't decide whether to say Mob or Mob. Mobile, 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 FP Mob, FP Mob, FP Mob. And I was called the App Platform. And the App Platform is a table of functions. I do not use expected and actual. It's unnecessary. Uh, since functions are first class in Kotlin, they are values that can be passed around. These are all the platform specific functions. This is simply a data structure containing pointers to functions. See, these are not subclassed. These are instances. Basically, the platform creates its own table of functions. You think of it as a V table being, because there is an interface. Um, actually, there isn't an interface. It's, well, it's a structure. It's kind of interface. It's a table. And the actual instance on Android looks like this. Android app platform. And as you can see, it's a function. It's not a subclass. All it does is it instantiates, creates the data structure, passing functions as actual values. So these functions are values sitting in this table. And this table is passed back and forth where needed. There's no expect, there's no actual, there's no class here. On the iOS side, we have the same thing. iOS app platform, and again, platform functions. This is called once, creates this table. Here's the implementations of those functions. Ideally, in the long run, this would be the only platform dependent or the platform bridging code, all in one place for now. Obviously, there's not that many functions, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, and this is the one that I just added, established database. So this call right here is where the Android SQLite driver is created. And I don't have a, I don't have dependency injection don't have a factory class, I don't need it, right? Basically, dependency injection is pass a new table. So I could try to pass this factory object that needs to be injected by a DI framework, or I could just have the functions that are different for platforms or different for testing and, and execution just be different tables of the same sets of functions. And that's what I've done in the testing framework as well. No factories, no dependency injection, because in a functional world, dependencies are just arguments. Just pass a different argument, you get a different dependency. Much simpler, in my opinion. So this is the call to establish database. And what does it look like on the iOS side? On the iOS side, Where's established database? There it is. Now, notice it's all it's doing is it's actually calling back into Kotlin. Why do I do that? Because most of the time on these platform functions, I'm actually doing platform specific stuff. Here's an example establish Firebase. This is actually calling um, this original function here that was it's part of the legacy code. This was already there. This is not something new I wrote. So the call to establish Firebase has to delegate over here. I'm not using it yet over here. As you can see, it's not implemented. Right? So this would be the Android implementation. 
is the iOS implementation. But in the case of the database, I'm actually using a KMP code, and KMP is doing the binding. So it's a little weird. We're going out to iOS, we're saying establish database however you're doing it. Like if I was not using KMP, I would do something else here. I might do SQLite and Direct and all that. But I'm using KMP, so I'm just kind of calling back and I'm passing the app mutant. By the way, the app mutant is this global god object that's mutable. It's the, it, the philosophy of this, of this design is going to be there's one mutable guy that gets passed around where needed. But most of the time, we want to pass this non-mutable app state. Uh, someday I'll talk about that. And also, it's a proof of concept to see if that even makes sense. So, um, so what happens? Where is this implemented? Well, it's actually implemented in the iOS folder of KMP, and it's the only thing implemented over here. So, if we look at AppFlow iOS, we're going to see. Oh, look! There's a function called Establish Database, and here's this is code written in Kotlin but is dependent on iOS, on binding to an iOS driver. This is provided automatically by SQL Delight. So this is kind of black box here. I don't know exactly what this is doing, right? But this is obviously, this is a Kotlin class, right? Whereas the Android version is a little more obviously, well, this is an Android SQLite driver, right? These are, uh, these are from these are from SQL Delight. And that's from that. And over here, this guy is the native driver. But this is sitting in the iOS folder, the, uh, the KMP iOS main folder, which only gets compiled as Kotlin, converted to Objective-C, and then passed into iOS. In fact, we could see what this looks like for fun in the generated code. So KMP, as you know, hopefully, basically compiles Kotlin into Objective-C, not Swift. Supposedly in the future they're gonna be doing Swift, but they compile it into Objective-C. And it generates one big header for everything that gets passed over to iOS. So basically everything in the common folder, everything in the iOS folder should show up in this header. So let's take a look. Let's see if we can find this header. Uh, We're gonna go to the, so this is the module directory, Rasha. And we're gonna go find dot name, Rasha.h, literally a single H file. Gets copied three times. There it's, gen again, generated code. There it's generated, uh, for the different platforms, and then it's copied into CocoaPods. So I'm still using CocoaPods. I've had this project around for a while. It obviously would be better to replace it with a, a proper new Xcode framework, but that's gonna take some time. So the CocoaPods things works even though it's ugly. And uh, let's take a look at this file. Okay, so this is a header file that gets generated. This is Objective-C, an Objective-C header. And let's see if this SQL Delight stuff is in there. Uh, what's it look like? We're looking at it right now. Native SQL SQLite SQL Light driver. Let's just see if there's even the native SQL in here. No, this does not go into this header. It goes into something. Hmm. If there's any SQL Delight stuff. That's my class. Okay, runtime transactor. Okay, so this is, we're starting to see some of the generated code. This is some of the generated code. Yep, these are the generated queries. Uh, in fact, let's just do a search for rehearsal for Shah. So KMP automatically puts that module name in, uh, in Pascal case here, prefixed everything. So what do we got? We got the queries, got the 
queries, get the queries. That's it, just the queries. Interesting. So that data class doesn't come over. So that generated code. I'm pretty sure this comes over. It has to come over. This gets converted to Objective C. It just doesn't have SQL Dell in the name. Uh, it's going to be data line set. There it is. There's a data line set and there's a data line set adapter. Yeah, see, this is that funky adapter thing. Really would not like to have to have that. So now we can get a sense of what this looks like. So we can see the transformations here. And here's the fun, the fun, fun part of multi-technology, multi-platform development. Right? This is this is pretty much standard application development in most of the world. We've got our SQL table description, table declaration with relational database types, SQL types. They get mapped, hence the ORM map, although they don't really call this an ORM. They're trying to get away from that word because it kind of has a, has a bad smell to it now. Most people don't like ORMs for good reasons. But it's a data mapper, so let's call it an SQM. S SRM, SQL, relational R, RRM, relational ORM, relation, relational relational mapper, <laughs> Kotlin relational mapper. Uh, data line set, data line set is what it looks like in Kotlin, and then KMP is doing its magic to convert it to Objective C, and it becomes an Objective C interface with properties. So this is the code that the iOS legacy code has to interface with. This is what it sees. It's going to see this header. And that needs to get mapped to what it used to be as core data. So SQL, Kotlin, Objective-C, and the original Objective-C look like that. So actually, that's kind of the difference. That's kind of, this is what's changed. So interface to interface, not too bad. This has got some base class that's just stuff. Uh, right, we don't have any of these methods because we didn't do any of that. So we basically have this. Where's that sort though? Ordinal sort. Why don't I have that in here? Line set, sort number, yeah. Oh, I put ordinal in there. That's that's my thing. Did I get that right? Ordinal? Cardinal begins in zero, ordinal begins in one. I always get those confused. Ordinal begins in zero. Um, and you can see that, for example, script in this case, we're actually bringing over the script ID. This is the ORM part. This is where you translate a foreign ID in a relational database to an in-memory relationship to another object in memory. This is the auto magic binding of tables become objects and key relations become memory references, which is what this is. That's retain, copy, 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 right? And everything here is arc, automatic reference counted uh, objects, which is another fun impedance between the two. We've got arc on Xcode, I keep saying Xcode, arc on iOS, and GC, garbage collected, Kotlin garbage collected over here. Although uh, KVM, when it goes native, do they garbage? Do they have a garbage collector in, that's running over here? Is there a multi? Is there a K, KMP runtime doing garbage collection of this stuff, and it has to map it to ARC? I don't know. No, because it's converted to Objective C, which is ARC. So it's ARC to ARC. Yeah, because there we got NS string, NS string. Did our numbers? What happened to our? So we don't have NS number. That's interesting. Our bulls. Okay, so ah, that's the adapter. That's the adapter. So the int 
must be long in the database. So integer must be long. No, this is integer is Boolean. Why isn't there an adapter for Boolean? Boolean becomes bool. I don't know, we'll figure that out. It's gonna probably be a problem. Everything else matches up pretty good. But these is, okay, so this is synced attribute. So this is in the original is a number, even though it's a Boolean, right? Is, is, these are obviously Booleans. I actually specifically made these Booleans over here, so that's fine. So really the only actual number is the sort number, which we're getting adapted. So once I get this working, I shouldn't have to think too much about most of this stuff, how these different types get marshaled back and forth to each other. And this is not even dealing with JSON. All right, so that is the third, fourth, fourth, third, third representation of essentially the same data. All right, we have data in a database represented as SQL declaration. We have data in a Kotlin object, at least when we're executing on Android, compiled into and represented as an object C, as an Objective C object under iOS. And in both cases, these are obviously going to get marshaled into JSON when communicating with the back end. Lovely. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay. I'm going to take a break from recording and we'll come back when it's time to actually start digging into this. Bye-bye.